Hello everybody, you have tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murderer on YouTube. I cover virtually any aspect of making a murderer. I go over the evidence, the documents, the photos. So if you'd like, stay tuned and in the future I'll have many more videos besides the one you're about to see. Hello, how's everybody doing? Uh, today we're here to do a little video about the Melissa Kaluzinski uh, case here. Uh, which is one of Zellner's other cases, for those of you who may not recognize that name. Um, it's one of Zellner's other cases. And recently, she was in front of the Illinois Appellate uh, Court and arguing um, a Brady violation. And uh, so it was actually televised. It's, I mean, it's like the first time that that's ever happened with uh, appellate proceedings in Illinois. So, um, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. So, anyways... So what we got is the, the she's there arguing about how her expert, upon reviewing the x-rays that were not um, deliberately um, unreadable, that, that were not unreadable essentially as, you know, that were essentially, the, 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 the x-rays that were given to defense counsel during the trial were black. You couldn't make out, you, there was nothing to see in them because they were pretty much all black. Um, and nobody had the technological expertise to fix them, right, at that time um, on the defense or whatever. So it was deliberately obscured and stuff. So they're arguing back and forth about whether or not it's um, a Brady violation. And the, the representative for the state is quite interesting with her argument. Um, but but Zellner's basically sitting there saying, look, my expert, Dr. Zimmerman, who's the foremost, you know, or among the foremost experts in, in the field of radiology, um, you know, it clearly has determined after looking at the, um, what they called the, the, the T, the, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the very, there's a JPEG, there's a type, different types of images. One is a JPEG, uh, that they're talking about. Another one is a, a T flack or something like that. I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I'm sorry. But anyways, that one, the T flack or whatever was, uh, clear and Dr. Zimmerman said that when he saw when he saw that version of it that he could clearly distinguish that there was no crack in the skull uh, there and then they go on to basically point out that what was mistaken as a crack in in this young you know in this kid's skull was actually one of the suture lines you know in in the cranium that's naturally there and when you're a kid those haven't fully closed so there are kind of open and not fully uh, grown together yet because we have little gaps. That's that's why I don't know if anybody's ever known But if you ever touch a baby's head, you can kind of feel like there's gaps kind of maybe a little bit or whatever you feel like little It's kind of soft spots. Well, that's because the cranium is still kind of almost mostly cartilage and and you know prepared to grow um, as the child grows right so anyway so this kid was young so that's what it was a suture line actually they've determined and all these things that they've determined and um the the state is just standing on the the medical testimony of the experts that are that you know were at trial that testified for the state who admitted to making a mistake and missing the fact that this kid did have a previous injury he had a um, what they call a subdural hematoma, uh, which was which they noticed that, that they realized it wasn't just from it wasn't they realized it wasn't recent. They realized that it was not something that just happened uh, in the incident with Melissa or the supposed incident with Melissa. They found out that and so it led to the fact that this kid, I guess, has some kind of history with hitting his head, the back of his head. So. When you when you get those factors to, you know factored in and you see the circumstances of Melissa's confession where she resisted them for hours and hours and hours and hours and said look I never did this I didn't do this you're you know whatever and eventually when they had suggested what they were looking for from her you know when they when they finally got to the point of just saying you know this is what we expect you know or whatever because she just wanted to get out of there she was desperate to get out of there and so that ploy comes out of you know well you got to tell us what you know. You got to tell us with the truth, you know, right? The way they do and all that sort of thing. And then they start suggesting what they believe happened. And so she ends up telling them that, except. And one thing that Zellner points out in this that you're going to see here today is that 
um, when Melissa demonstrates how it happened for the officers there, and she's using a teddy bear to represent the child, she tells them, because they tell her, oh, well, we believe that he had a, a short fall and, and cracked, you know, his skull or whatever. She she said, and, and like he was shaking maybe, or and then had a short fall and cracked his skull or whatever. She held the teddy bear with the with the the face of the teddy bear facing outward and kind of shook it or whatever, like they said, and then like kind of threw it down with a tiny bit of force or whatever, basically, right? Well, the teddy bear would, or the child would land on its face. Well, this, everything that there's all about, this thing that the x-ray was all about, all this was all on the back of the, the kid's skull. So her confession kind of invalidates itself because she resisted for so long she eventually was breaking down and she was just trying to tell them what they wanted to hear thinking that she might be able to get out of there and go home which some people end up believing after so long in there and and they're so you know turned around and desperate and no matter what no matter how much they try to tell the truth they are not going to getting you know they're not going to be believed and it wears on them and wear it wore on her you can tell because that's like a provably false fact of her confession that 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 really shows she was only trying to piece together a story from what the officers were feeding her the little bits and, and stuff that they were feeding her that they would accept because she was trying to get out of there and she thought that that would do it instead of sealing her fate which it did so we're going to see the appellate proceedings here right now you'll see it's about 40 minutes and you'll see the first kathleen zellner up there talking to the three appellate judges she goes for about 15 minutes or so and then she sits down and leaves five minutes for you know her to, to rebut at the end or whatever then we get the the state's representative up there and the state's representative um answers the you know questions of the judges and that sort of thing so um it's pretty interesting stuff and then zelda gets another five minutes at the end to go ahead and address a few things that you know was said by the representative of the state and that sort of thing so it's really interesting stuff um the argument is over a brady violation and and how important that brady violation is and the state wants to say that the that the x-rays and the you know both images were tendered for trial or whatever and there's a lot of dispute about that and whether or not that's true and and it's you know so it's really fascinating stuff really honestly so here we go folks uh and i'll come back one one time before we go your honors the third case of the morning fall 216-0825 people of the state of illinois versus melissa kowalski representing Ms. kowalski Ms. kathleen kathleen t zellner on behalf of the people Ms. mary beth burns Good morning, Council. Good morning, Council. Good morning to all of you. Uh, may it please the Court and Council. I think the issues are, are very clear on our case. Is there a Brady violation? Have we met the requirements of a Brady violation? We have gone through a third stage evidentiary hearing. We must demonstrate manifest error in the trial court's uh, factual findings and credibility findings. We believe uh, that we can meet that burden. First, counsel, uh, I have a question regarding the state's duty of disclosure regarding the x-rays. After the September 7th, 2011 disclosure of the x-ray in the JPEG form, of the state and defense counsel were in court and in open court the state and defense counsel agreed to work together so that readable x-rays would be made available to the defense the trial court invited the parties to come back into court and advise um, him if there were any problems counsel asked for and got an order from the trial court on October 21st allowing it to view all of the evidence that the coroner had including the computer here under those facts and circumstances how was the effect 
any suppression of the version of the x-ray on the coroner's computer, version of this particular skull x-ray. How was there any suppression if the defense had access to it? And how then would this be a Brady, Brady violation? Yes, Your Honor, I think that's a, a pivotal question in the case. So going back to the September 7th disclosure of the disk, at that point in time, Mr. DeLuca was told that the x-rays, which we now know were in a JPEG format, so they were compressed. 98% of the data was not present. They were con condensed down to 1% of the data. He was told that those x-rays were illegible, that the coroner's assistant was on vacation, that those were illegible, and then he had a subsequent conversation he testified to with the assistant state's attorney that had she had any luck opening up with the Tiger View program, the x-ray, she also said no, they had had no luck. The assistant state's attorney, DeMartini, claimed that he went on September 16th to meet at the coroner's office with Mike Reed, and at that time, they attempted to improve the quality of the x-rays, and they were unable to do so. So this is why the credibility findings in the case are important. There is no question that the TIFF images, 48, 49, and 50, 49 and 50 are the two crucial ones, were saved in TIFF format on the coroner's computer. They were there the entire time. The question is, what is the duty of Mr. DeLuca to have taken that next step when he was given the illegible x-rays in the JPEG format and to go in himself after the assistant state's attorney had talked to supposedly Mike Reed and again been told the x-rays cannot be subpoenas he issued and getting an order from the court himself that allowed him to go into the coroner's office, the computer, and look at it apart from any disk that he was given. The order that Mr. DeLuca got was for the general discovery that he could examine all of that. But if we look at the Del Creek case and compare what is the duty of the defense attorney when they have not been fully disclosed, in that case the Kroll letter, what is the duty of that defense attorney, Mr. Bretz, to pursue and assume that something has been withheld from them? I think that Mr. DeLuca relied on the representation made in court that the x-rays were illegible. He says he had subsequent conversations with S.A. Bishop of whether she'd been able to open up the x-rays and was told that she could not. And then we had Mr. DeMartini testifying that they were unsuccessful when he was in the coroner's office opening those images. Now that's a lot of information past the initial disclosure that would have dissuaded Mr. DeLuca from conducting about the x-rays. And I think what the court said in Del Creek is that yes, Mr. Bretz could have called Detective Kroll. He could have possibly discovered this nondisclosure. But in this case, we have what appears to be a more deliberate effort to withhold this evidence. We contended at the evidentiary hearing there never was a meeting with DeMartini and the coroner, Reed. Coroner Reed, the assistant coroner, said the first time he was involved in the case was in 2015. He didn't have a meeting. He didn't open up the images. He didn't make any misrepresentations about not being able to access the TIF images. But the facts are as they are. As the court has outlined, yes, Mr. DeLuca could have gone in, could have second-guessed them, could have gone in, and could have perhaps with the assistant, but I don't know who it would have been because Mr. Reed. Well, he could have brought his own experts in with him when he went, isn't that correct? 
Possibly he could have, Your Honor. And I guess it depends on what kind of duty are we going to impose on defense attorneys. When you have that representation in open court that the x-rays are illegible, when you try yourself to look at them, when your own expert gets similarly, remember Dr. Tease also got the JPEG images reduced down to 20 kilobytes. Well, there was a question in the record as to which she looked at, wasn't there, counsel? Actually, Mr. DeLuca submitted an affidavit, which is one of our exhibits, that he confirmed that she'd gotten the JPEG images. Our expert testified those were even further reduced down below what Mr. DeLuca had received. But then, nevertheless, part of her testimony at the trial was that she saw a defect in the autopsy photos that could have been a fracture. Isn't that correct? I'm not certain if it was a fracture or not. That's why this new evidence is so important, because the TIFF images establish a critically important fact in the case that was told incorrectly to the jury. The jury was told, even in the closing argument, the jury is told that the cause of death was a skull fracture, and it was a through-and-through fracture. That's in the closing argument, and that's at page, I think it's, I can give you the exact site to it, because I thought it was, it's on page 4732. The first proposition we have to show that the defendant performed an action that caused death. We have it. What were the acts? Threw him in the ground, cracked his head. But they also received an instruction regarding cause of death that went beyond that. Isn't that correct? Correct. And I think the issue is we're really talking about manner of death, because what Dr. Zimmerman did at the evidentiary hearing, and remember there's no radiologist that ever testified in the Kaluzinski case, because we have illegible x-rays. That's what Mr. DeLuca thought, but they weren't illegible. And Dr. Zimmerman, the pediatric neuroradiologist, testified to several things that would have changed the outcome in the trial. One is there's absolutely no fracture. Two is no one on a clinical exam ever touched the fracture. So Dr. Montes did not touch this fracture and did not manipulate the fracture. Dr. Choi never saw a fracture. There is not a fracture. Dr. Choi didn't see a fracture? He testified he did. There's no fracture. He didn't see a fracture. So it would have refuted what he said also. Go ahead, get some water. Dr. Zimmerman testified that he did not see a fracture on the TIF x-ray. But Dr. Choi testified that in his physical examination of the skull, he not only saw a fracture with his naked eye, but he touched the fracture and felt it as well. And that was the testimony, actually, of Dr. Montes as well. And the defense witnesses, we talked about Dr. Tease, but Dr. Lietzma indicated that there was a linear fracture consistent possibly with a short fall. And Dr. Lietzma testified that it could not be ruled out that the victim was slammed to the floor. So that defense witnesses at the trial also testified based on photographs, not viewing, of course, the TIF x-ray that Dr. Zimmerman saw. But that is what's so crucial, Your Honor, because the data given to the defense attorney was reduced down to 1%, a 98% reduction of the data. He did not get a pediatric neuroradiologist. Dr. Zimmerman's testimony isn't speculation. Dr. Zimmerman testified there absolutely was not a fracture in this child's skull. That is different. In his opinion. In his opinion, as a renowned abusive head trauma expert who wrote the definitive paper for the National Institute of Health. So we didn't, 
Melissa Kaluzinski did not have the benefit of having a radiologist testify at her trial that there was not a fracture. If there had been such a radiologist as Dr. Zimmerman, I do not think Dr. Montez's rebuttal would have stood unimpeached because it was unimpeached. What Dr. Zimmerman said is there cannot be a clinical finding of a fracture based on the TIF x-ray. There is no skull fracture. This was supposedly a through and through fracture. So the trial evidence of forensic pathologists, none of whom looked at the x-ray, no slides were taken as Dr. T said. You must do a histology if you don't have the x-rays to determine if there's a fracture. So you have people looking at photographs and you have two doctors talking about manipulating the fracture. That's what Dr. Jones in her affidavit in 2015 said. What Dr. Choi did and Dr. Montez did was they confused an accessory suture. There's an identical fracture. You're confusing them on the other side of the baby's head. But Dr. Jones did testify that she saw a fracture. No, no. She said that they confused the fracture, that they confused the fracture with the accessory suture. And she said that was a common mistake that was made. But what's so important, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I feel like I'm interrupting. Finish your sentence. I'm sorry. What's so different about what we produced at the evidentiary hearing was we had clear TIF images, 16 megabytes, 17 megabytes. We had a pediatric neuroradiologist who testified there was not a fracture in the skull and no one on a clinical exam had touched a fracture or manipulated. So if Dr. Zimmerman had been at the trial, the jury would have heard that. Dr. Choi testified that x-rays were taken and that the quality of the x-rays probably wasn't very good. Isn't that correct? It's very self-serving that he testified to that because he never asked Paul Foreman to reshoot the x-rays, which he had done in the past. And that's what Mr. Foreman testified to. Whenever we had a problem with the x-rays, he would ask me to reshoot them. And we know the x-rays that were saved in 2009, we know those x-rays are perfect. We know they've got all the data that was needed to determine if there was a fracture. Why does Dr. Zimmerman's opinion invalidate the opinions of all these other experts who testified that there was a skull fracture? Dr. Zimmerman's opinion invalidates all of those experts because none of them had the qualifications that he has. They had the qualifications to do the job that they did. Dr. Zimmerman, with all due respect, could not have conducted the autopsy counsel and done the examination of the body. Well, let's look at the autopsy result. Dr. Choi admitted in his affidavit he made a mistake about the chronic subdural hematoma. Only with respect to the age. No, he made a mistake and he said it didn't exist and Dr. Greenbaum said it did not exist and he looked at the slides. That is a big mistake in an abusive head trauma case to have told this jury there was no chronic subdural hematoma when there was. We have an affidavit from the pathologist who did the autopsy. You have two giant mistakes. No expert came off their opinion that there was a skull fracture, though, correct? At which point? After all this came to light. You mean at the trial? You indicated that Dr. Choi indicated later that there was an old head wound, that he was mistaken. Right. But neither Dr. Choi nor any other expert came off the fracture comments, correct? They were never presented with the evidence from Dr. Zimmerman. When we got the affidavit from Dr. Choi, we were strictly, at that point, we didn't know about the x-rays. We didn't know about the compressed data. So all we had approached him about was the chronic subdural hematoma. We had no idea that there actually was not a skull fracture. And if you look at, in this court's opinion in 2014, when the court talked about the corpus delecti of this crime and how it corroborated the confession, the medical evidence corroborated the confession, the other key point that Dr. Zimmerman said is the skull fracture that's been described, not only 
doesn't exist. There is no skull fracture. It does not fit the rendition of the defendant in the interrogation tape. She was holding the child facing out. He said if you had a forceful impact on the front, you would have a fracture on the front, not the back of the skull. Well, but if you used that reenactment, there is no way that the and the defendant's um, discussion with the detectives in her discussion she three times that during the course of uh, that child hit his head, the back of his head, on the floor three times. So that Dr. Zimmerman either didn't see or didn't pick up or didn't mention in his testimony, but it's, it's not viewable on the reenactment tape. I agree, Your Honor, that the camera doesn't catch what, when she finally moves to saying that she lost her temper and threw the child down, was immediately after Detective Falenko came in the room and said, what you're telling us isn't true, you're not showing enough force because a fracture caused his death. That is a quote from Falenko at that point in the interrogation tape. She takes the teddy bear, which is about the third the size and a fraction of the weight of Ben Kingan, and demonstrates, but she's still demonstrating, and she said she picked him up facing out, and that matters. So we have, is this a verdict that's worthy of confidence? When you have two medical findings that have now been refuted, one by the state pathologist, that there's no chronic subdural, or that there is a chronic subdural hematoma, and then the second one by a pediatric radiologist. Um, of course, there were no radiologists at the trial who says there never was a fracture. You have two major medical findings. The other thing that Dr. Zimmerman said is the hemorrhages, subdural, subarachnoid, and subgaleal, are consistent with an accident. Those are consistent. What is not consistent in the literature, and he's authored some of those peer-reviewed documents, is the linear through and through fracture. That is consistent with abusive head trauma. And Excuse me, that doesn't have time. exist. Just one second. Let me just see if there were okay. other questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. Thank, you'll have time on the phone. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Burns? Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the Court, my name is Mary Beth Burns, and I represent the people of the state of Illinois. We come before Your Honor this morning to respectfully ask you to affirm following a third stage hearing. As this Court is aware, and as counsel mentioned, this Court asked us to be prepared to discuss a recent third district case, Del Perret. In addition to various factual differences, I think the thing to take away from Del Perret is the thing that we have argued here, which is the trial court should be affirmed because it followed the, sta the standards of review. This court typically will, will, following a third stage hearing, affirm the trial court when the trial court's factual determinations are based on the manifest weight of the evidence. In Del Perret, the result is different, but it's the same mechanism. The appellate court in the third district affirmed the circuit court's determination. In that case, a factual determination that there was a letter that had not been tendered. And here you've got a factual determination that whether the quality of the x-rays was appropriate at that point in time, those x-rays were in fact tendered. Well, how, how is turning over an unreadable, illegible x-ray compliance with the state's discovery obligations, counsel? I think that the trial court was attempting to get the discovery clarified, so by ordering the 
opening of the coroner's computer and other records. And those things are always available. How would, Mr. Uh, how would Mr. DeLuca know that there was a more legible x-ray on the computer when the only thing that was told to him in open court by ASA Bishop was that it was unreadable? I guess my concern would be where the trial court said that you could talk to the coroner's office, you could talk to the coroner and assume that ASA Bishop knew as little about computers as Mr. DeLuca perhaps did. And as I standing here, know, I know very little about computers. But if I've been given access to the actual computer where the images was, were stored, and I would be given access to the coroner's files, I would believe that was, in fact, the court ordering the, the discovery availability. And Just a couple weeks before the trial started, though, right? I mean, that wasn't much time, was it? It was not a great deal of time. It was, however, enough time that if the defense had... Let me, let me back up one second. I guess that part of the trial court's determination at the third stage hearing is that the defense did not pursue it further because his theory of defense did not require the x-ray to show or not show a fracture. Dr. Chakoutis based her opinion not knowing if there was a fracture and not being convinced that there was. Dr. Tease had, in fact, had a significant amount of the information, including histology, histology slides, and it was the trial court's belief that she also had had the coroner's actual x-rays. So to the extent that Mr. DeLuca's theory did not include, did not require there to have been a fracture or not a fracture, that his theory was that the confession did not match the medical evidence, and where the medical evidence did not absolutely show trauma, that the jury could disregard her testimony. But the defense conceded the fracture because it didn't have evidence that it didn't exist. Obviously, Dr. Zimmerman testified afterwards, so they didn't have the option. Well, and again, they had the option of getting a different, getting a forensic radiologist, had they wanted to, to actually blow up the x-rays in the same way that they were done prior at the hearing. The impression that I've gotten from reading the record and from reading the trial court's order in the third stage hearing is that everything the state had, the state turned over, and that everything that the state turned over was capable of being opened in usable format. The other question that I have... Excuse me, the JPEG? The state, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't misunderstand you. The state had the JPEG version, correct? I believe so. I guess the impression that I got is that what was turned over was capable of being opened up, and had they, you know, and it might have required getting a computer expert to do so, but that the state tendered what it had, which was capable of being opened. Was that enough? Yes. To satisfy their obligation of disclosure under Brady? Yes. Why? Because they tendered what they had. Brady is about suppression. Nothing, nothing prevented, and again, nothing prevented both the state and the defense from going to the coroner and saying, we can't read these, open them up for us. Because from Dr. T's report, apparently she did read them. Whether she read, and my understanding is that she either was physically at the coroner's or she had access to coroner's records. And so where Dr. T's had been able to read them, they were readable. And the fact that the trial court, in encouraging discovery, encouraged them to go to the coroner's and have access to everything, including the computer, shows that, in fact, this was available material. But now the jury never heard an expert claim that Ben's skull was not fractured. Isn't that correct? I believe that Dr. T said that she was unsure of it. I believe Dr. Biesma's testimony was based on the assumption that it was. All right. But Dr. Zimmerman's testimony would have opened up a completely new theory that was unavailable to the defense at trial and which 
goes to the very heart of the verdict. Isn't that correct? I think that I would question whether it was unavailable. Again, because the, all the coroner's data was available to the defense and to the state both. Also, Dr. Zimmerman said that the x-rays were badly taken. And so, although Dr. Zimmerman is a noted expert, where Dr. Zimmerman also said that they were not good x-rays, I'm not sure that I would, I'm not sure that I believe that it undermines the testimony of the emergency room physician, the two coroners who actually saw the body physically, including, including looking things with their two eyes and then looking at things with photographs. And so I'm not entirely sure that Dr. Zimmerman's view of what he considered bad x-rays undermines the medical, medical evidence that was already presented. Wouldn't the question be whether or not there was a reasonable probability that the jury would have credited Dr. Zimmerman's testimony that there was no fracture? Isn't that what we should be asking ourselves? Well, for a Brady claim, the first thing one has to be asking was, was the information tender? Materiality comes after. For Brady, you have to have both thresholds. You have information that was withheld and you have to have that information demonstrably material. Nothing was withheld here. Was the trial court in a position to say that the JPEG was just as good after it was enhanced as the TIFF? My understanding from the record and from his comments is that when it was enhanced, it was far more readable and that the enhancement was a readily available operation of the program. Is that within his purview to make that finding in light of a radiologist testifying to the contrary and no one else testifying the way that the trial court held? As the trier of fact, it is his purview to make that determination. So he can look at an x-ray and determine whether or not that x-ray is readable for purposes of a diagnosis. By a radiologist. Yeah, by a radiologist. A judge can do that. A judge has an expertise. Okay, if we're asking the judge to be the trier of fact, as we are at a third stage evidentiary hearing, then it is the purview of the trier of fact to determine whether the evidence, the credible evidence taken as a whole, undermines faith in the jury's verdict. And that is what we ask judges to do on a day-in, day-out basis. Well, that's the materiality part. I'm talking about whether it was actually tendered. You're arguing two different things. Well, right, I'm arguing... Right, you're arguing, first of all, that it was tendered, that these things were tendered. What was tendered was the JPEG, correct? Yes. Okay. And the judge made a finding after the third stage that that was tendered. And the reason he made that finding was because it could be enhanced by the Tiger View. Right. Okay. And again, the Tiger part of the program was part of what was tendered. So I get back to my question. Is a judge, does a judge have the expertise to determine whether something is radiologically sound? The judge can make a determination based on a radiology expert who said that they were not well taken. Other than that, again, a trial court is not a medical expert. But again, looking at this case, both at the trial and at the third stage evidentiary hearing, there was a significant amount of medical evidence presented. You had the child's treating physicians, his pediatricians. You had the emergency room doctor. You had the doctors who performed the autopsies. You had Dr. Zimmerman later. You had Dr. Jones. Again, there was a significant amount of medical evidence at various stages. You had the treating physicians. You had the emergency physicians. You had the autopsy pathologists. You had subsequent pathologists who came in later. You all saw a skull fracture except who? I'm sorry? All saw a skull fracture except who? I think that's correct. Again, the original treating pediatricians never saw evidence of earlier injury. 
emergency rooms, if I have this correct. Autopsies each saw evidence of skull fracture, and each, and Dr. Montez especially, said that he manipulated it. So they actually saw the skull fracture with the glass. Again, Dr. Zimmerman did not see the, the body, did see all the photographs, I assume, and all the histology, and saw the... I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure that Dr. Zimmerman's testimony, based on what he specifically said were not good x-rays, can be taken definitively that there was, in fact, no skull fracture. Perhaps more important for our situation, one of the defense experts, Dr. Tease, was never convinced that there was a skull fracture, and the jury heard her opinion that was based on other medical evidence, including her belief that there had been earlier injuries that were healing. And so the jury heard things that did not include a skull fracture as well. So is it, is it your position, or was it the position of the state at the time? It's, it seems to me that that's what I'm hearing um, the defense propose, that merely because if there were no skull fracture, it could not be suicide. Is that your position? It would be my take an x-ray then back in October when he was injured. His pediatricians never took an x-ray. No, they right. did not. So they were, bas they were basing it on the way his symptoms presented. Correct. And there can be some debate about how a child would react or not react. Um, I, I will say that, and I, and I think even, even the defense, I believe, even the defense experts did not think that he could have caused the type of ongoing injury that they believed had happened simply by his traumatic throwing himself around, which apparently he did have a long-term history of doing. You would agree, though, that the state relied extensively on the fracture to, prove, to prove abuse as opposed Absolutely. to a chronic condition. Absolutely. And now the defense has come up with an expert to say there was no fracture. And you're saying that doesn't affect the materiality of the situation? Sufficiently compelling to undermine a verdict that was based on a significant amount of medical testimony. <coughs> two, of, two, of the, two of which were defense experts, and it's my recollection that they were, the jurors were instructed that they did not have to disregard her confession, even if they found whatever occurred was only a partial cause of the death, and that the death, in fact, did result from an earlier injury. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Back to Justice Burke's question at the evidentiary hearing. Uh, because it ties to another uh, point that I want to make. The judge did attempt to step into the shoes of a pediatric neuroradiologist when he compared in uh, the state's exhibit 137 the JPEG with the TIFF and concluded as if he could interpret it uh, himself 
that uh, there was no sufficient uh, difference in the quality. They were essentially the same. So what happened at the evidentiary hearing is the state declined to present a pediatric radiologist or a radiologist to try to refute Dr. Zimmerman. They did not have Dr. Montez or Dr. Choi testify that they were absolutely certain that there was a fracture. Rather, there was no response to Dr. Zimmerman in terms of a comparable expert, and, and then the judge made the decision, which is ludicrous because a, a JPEG and a TIFF image are absolutely not the same. Counsel also um, misstated what Dr. Zimmerman testified to. Dr. Zimmerman testified the JPEG image was unreadable and inferior. Dr. Zimmerman testified that the TIFF image was perfect, and that's how he could see that there was no skull fracture. So she's confusing what he said. All of the experts at the trial, none of them looked at the x-rays, and only two of the prosecution witnesses actually claimed to have touched the fracture. So no one else ever saw the, the skull or, or anything. Um, and that's why their testimony, if their testimony is refuted, the jury heard from Dr. Montez, the last thing the jury heard in this case was there was a through and through fracture and he was manipulating it and that there was blood uh, in the fracture and that it was this violence that had been inflicted upon this child. And now what we know is that that isn't true, that there was no through and through fracture, that there's not a fracture, and that stands unrebutted. Well, that's well, do Dr. Zimmerman's opinion that there is no fracture. That is the opinion of the only neuroradiologist who's ever testified in Melissa Kalyzinski's trial. She but didn't have the benefit of a Dr. Zimmerman at her trial, despite the state mentioning 93 times the skull fracture. It was the key point from the confession on in driving this to an intentional act. Now your burden at this point is that the defendant has to show that the favorable evidence could reasonably have put the whole case in such a different light as to undermine the confidence of the verdict. That's your burden at this point. That is correct. You have one doctor who says there was no skull fracture and you have a plethora of other doctors who all say that there was. How are you going to meet that burden? Okay, because there's actually two components to it. One is that we have proof without rebuttal through an image expert that this x-ray that was turned over was compressed and the actual TIFF x-ray existed. No one else in the trial got to see the TIFF x-ray. If the pathologist, maybe they could have determined too there was no skull fracture. But I don't think you can diminish Dr. Zimmerman's role because it's the pivotal issue in the case and they have, and we have a judge making a decision and reading the x-ray. So the question is, did Melissa Kaczynski get a fair trial? Because the other component of this is that the state contended all the way through that this baby was healthy, there were no prior injuries. Yes, he'd had this little bump on his head in October of 08. What do we know now? We know there was a chronic subdural hematoma that the pathologist who performed the autopsy said he made a mistake and didn't see that. That, that also has to be computed into the reasonable probability. This is a case that went down on the forensic expert evidence, a reasonable probability that the outcome, not that it would result in an acquittal, that's not the standard, it's not a sufficiency standard, a reasonable probability the whole case would be put in a light that would undermine confidence in the verdict. How is this a fair trial? Defense witnesses at the trial also testified, in fact, that was the theory, that this was a chronic subdural hematoma situation. So there was that testimony. There was, but imagine if you had the state pathologist who did the autopsy saying, you know what, they're right. There was a chronic the jury subdural, that's pretty huge. I've not seen that in my career. Uh, but on top of it, I think the skull fracture, yes, one man, Dr. Zimmerman, uh, who is, you know, one of the leading experts in the United States, and he questions the confession. He, can, he, he is saying, no way anyone saw or touched the fracture in autopsy. 
That's huge evidence for a jury to consider. This was not a fair trial. This was not a fair trial. Thank you. Thank you very much, counsel. Thank you, counsel, for your arguments this morning. The court will take the matter under advisement and render a decision in due course. The court stands in recess for the day. Thank you. So, as I said, fascinating, fascinating stuff, really. I mean, one thing I thought was interesting, folks, did you see the way that the, the state's representative was actually starting to get kind of stuttery? Like, and, and, and was, like, beginning to, like, offer qualifying statements at the beginning of everything that she said? Um, like, well, as far as I know or to my understanding, you know, that type of thing, she started answering the questions that way. I mean, that that's a sign that she was feeling in a position of weakness um, to be talking that way. So, I, like I say, interesting stuff, but it's awesome to be able to see it. It's totally, I mean, I wish we could have seen, um, you know, actual the footage of Brendan, either any of his, his three judge panel or the on bank. I mean, it would have been cool to see that video of, of, of what those, you know, proceedings were like. You know, we know all the players in the case and, and, and everybody were all, were all there, obviously. Um, and I wish I could have, to be perfectly honest, but uh, that wasn't in the cards. So anyway, this case, you know, like I say, is fascinating. I think it's getting overturned. The Brady violation, I believe, is, is significant. As you heard Ms. Zellner saying there over the course of that, uh, um, you know, arguing that in front of that panel is that, the 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 state has never ever first of all there was never a radiologist that that testified at trial um, because the defense couldn't read the x-rays they never got one they just they didn't realize what you know that had they been able to see those and get a radiologist to testify the state would have never been able to say that that kid had a crack in his skull like they did 77 times throughout the trial and the other thing she's pointing out there is how the state has not in the in these appellate and post conviction proceedings to this point, even though Zellner has brought out the expert radiologist for the first time in this case, the state has not produced a radiologist that can back their claim that that the kid did have a crack on his skull and that, you know, all the stuff that their medical, you know, personnel said. Even though one of those medical personnel did admit to making a mistake uh, and, and misdiagnosing a, a uh, chronic subdural hematoma, meaning it was something that was continually happening, happening for some time um, preceding the supposed incident with L Melissa Kalazinski. So that's the in another interesting bit here, folks. I mean, the, the prosecution of the state still has not tried to refute and that was another thing that Zellner was pointing out to those judges, you know, is, is the fact that they hadn't. So that's interesting stuff as well. Um, so that would have made a huge, huge, huge difference. And that's why it, as a Brady, as a Brady violation, not turning over the x-rays, the proper x-rays that could be analyzed um, is a Brady violation, basically. So and I think, you know, it's very, like I said, it was very interesting to see. So that's about it for today, folks. If you haven't already... Please hit subscribe and we'll see you.